is good to meet every single one of you. Why don't we pray the way our Lord taught us? Let's do it together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Tell me the stories of Jesus. I love to hear things I would ask him to tell me if he were here, things by the wayside, tales of the sea, stories of Jesus, tell them to me. I had sat with the Apostle Peter for length of days, begging him to tell me the stories of Jesus. And Peter said this to me, he said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but that he would serve, and so that he would give his life for a ransom of many. And so with that in mind, I wrote the Gospel of Mark. Jesus Christ, the perfect servant, and I, I wrote it so that we can follow his life as he did ministry all the way from Galilee and made his way to the cross at Jerusalem and finally ascending to his father. And I shall do this for you in four scenes. Scene one, the servant is here. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, make his path straight. He speaks of John the Baptist who came onto the scene with a message of repentance, be baptized. And as John found himself by the river Jordan, behold, who cometh but the Lamb of God himself, Jesus, the perfect servant, requiring that he be baptized by John. John was a little bit taken aback, but Jesus insisted that it had to be John to baptize him. And as he took that plunge in the water and came up, behold, the heaven itself opened up and a voice declared, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And before you know it, this dove descended down upon him. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Then immediately, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness where he, this perfect servant, was tempted by the devil for 40 long days. 40 the 40 years that the children of Israel failed in the wilderness, he, the perfect servant, gained victory. Where Adam had failed in the Garden of Eden, this Jesus, this perfect servant, guaranteed victory over temptation from the enemy. And the enemy realizing that he had lost this round, departed from the perfect servant until a more opportune time. Scene two, the servant's ministry in Galilee. While his popularity grew by leaps and bounds in Galilee, Jesus was doing all sorts of miracles. He was healing the sick, he was casting out demons, he was delivering people, he was preaching the gospel of his father. The kingdom of God has come. 
But he not only did miracles and healings and deliverance. After all, he came for something more important than that, the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of our sins can be described by far as the greatest miracle of Jesus Christ. It was, in fact, the most needed. We needed to be forgiven, to be redeemed to our Father. It was the most costly miracle that Jesus Christ would have done. And he found himself at a home in Capernaum preaching the gospel. And suddenly the roof seemed to be opening up and four men lowered down their friend, a cripple. So desperate were they for Jesus Christ to touch and to heal. And Jesus looked at this man and he said something amazing. He said, your sins are forgiven. The religious leaders quite offended. How dare he forgive anyone? Who are you? You are not God to forgive anyone. But Jesus recognized that sometimes we do not just need physical healing, but what we need more than anything else is the forgiveness of our sins. He fulfilled the promises. He came and he found himself associating with scums with rejects. And the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders said unto him, why do you associate with those? And Jesus said to them, a healthy person does not require a physician, but I came to call sinners to repentance. Little did they know how much people needed him. He also came so that he can give salvation. Jesus knew that salvation was not patchwork. He did not come to put old, to put new unto old, but he came so that we can have robes of righteousness. He came so that we can have freedom, freedom from the religious laws, laws given to Moses from God and the Pharisees held the people in bondage and Jesus came during them and he healed on the very Sabbath declaring to them that I am master even of the Sabbath. And everywhere he went, the crowd followed him and he had to impress upon his disciples, never ever be fooled by a crowd, never be distracted by numbers. And how did he deal with this? Well, he founded a new nation because he knew that even within a large crowd, all of the people were not there to be spiritually filled, to be saved. But within that crowd, people just were fans. People just wanted something for him. And even within that crowd, there were those who wanted to kill him. And so he spent one night in prayer. I could hardly imagine him up all night praying, seeking his father's wisdom as to who do I choose to follow after me. And imagine that he chose 12 unlikely bunch, 12 men unworthy of themselves, but he called them and he trained them and he sent them out so that when he had completed his earthly ministry, they would be able to follow through and complete the ministry on earth. No matter where he went, the crowd pressed upon him. They hardly had time to eat anything. And the religious leaders, they hated him. They accused him of being of the devil. They referred to him as Beelzebub. And he chastised them, and he admonished them, and he judged them that they should not give powers from God unto the enemy. Why, even his very own mother, his family, they thought he was crazy. Jesus would not come home to eat or to rest. And so they went to where he was in the house in Capernaum, and they said to him, Jesus, your mother and your brother are out. And he said a strange thing. He said, who is my mother 
And who is my brother? Who is my sister? Lay in the argument that he had come to call all of us into his spiritual family. Those who would only but believe that he truly was son of God, God himself, Messiah. He announced a new kingdom. They thought that he had come to overthrow Rome, but Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. He had called us to believe into who he was, a spiritual birth that we can now become kingdom people. And he spoke in parables, and he spoke about a sower, sowing seeds, imploring us to believe his word, trust in his word. Do not let the enemy steal the word from us. And he spoke about lamps that should not be hidden, but our light must shine brightly. He spoke about mustard seed growing so large that even the birds of the air would live there and eat the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God and those, he said, who were unwilling to believe, whatever they had would be taken away from them and they would lose their life. He was master, master. When I said master, the man was master over everything, gaining victory after victory after victory. He called his disciples to go over the Sea of Galilee. And while on the sea, so tired was he for caring after people that he found himself asleep. And there arose suddenly a massive storm on the sea. And while he was sleeping, maybe even drooling, the disciples became afraid and they said, Master, carest not thou that we perish? And he got up and he said, oh ye of little faith. And he looked at the wave and the wind and he said, shut up. Shh. And he was silent. And they were in awe, they were shocked, they were afraid. But they got to the shore and before they even had time to say, Jesus, what did you just do? There came a man, a demoniac, filled in chains, bowed. And Jesus looked at the man and he said, come out of them. And the disciples looked, what shall we do with Jesus, son of God? And they begged him that he would not ask them to leave the region. And he placed them into pigs. And these crazy pigs ran all the way down to the sea and drowned. And he said to this man who wanted to follow him, go back home to your families and your friends and tell them about all the good things that I have done for you. And this man, this Gentile became a first one to go forth and to tell Gentile people the Lord saves. Messiah had come and he found himself back over into Galilee. And before he even had time to rest, there came this man, this religious ruler, Jairus. And Jairus had an issue. Jairus' daughter was on the brink of death. And he said, Lord, if you would come and touch my daughter, I know that she would be saved. And Jesus said, come on, let's go. But before he even got there, in comes this woman. And she's touching the hem of his garment and he sensed it. The power had gone out of him and he said, who touched me? And the disciples flabbergasted, said, what do you mean who touched you? We're in the midst of a crowd of people. And he said, no, I know somebody touched me. And he looked at this sister and she told him of her plight. And he said to her, your faith has made you hold victory upon victory upon victory. And while so many people believed in him, the religious leaders and the scribes, the Pharisees, they, they were so acquainted with him so much that they thought that, who is the little Jojo's boy to come here and do all of these things? What authority does he have? And they had such unbelief that Jesus could not do the miracle that he wanted there. And he left. And yet he saw 
the needs of the people and so filled with compassion that he had these 12 unlikely men and he said to them, I am sending you out, heal the sick, deliver the people, cast out demons in my name. And they went and they did this great work. <coughs> Jesus so many times had to withdraw not because he hated the people, not because he was tired of them, but because he knew that his disciples needed rest. He himself needed rest. They needed time to recuperate and to eat. And so he called these disciples away so that they can tell him the great miracle that they had done in his name. But the crowd, the crowd would not leave him alone. And there they were late in the evening, surrounded by a host of people. And the disciples wanted them to go away. Those disciples, then all the time they keep dropping the ball. And Jesus looked at them and said, you give them something to eat. And they wondered, we, what, what do I feed them? What do I give them to eat? Do I use my entire year's wage and feed these people? And Jesus said to them, who in the crowd has anything? And there was this one little boy who had a great mother and she had packed him this lunch as he followed after Jesus and he had five loaves and two fish and Jesus took it. And he lifted it towards heaven and he gave thanks and he blessed it and it became enough to feed 5,000 people. Why? Peter said it almost blew his mind. He could not believe what Jesus had done. And still, still they were exhausted. And Jesus said to them, let us go over to the other side. And while he went up to the mountainside to pray, and there they found themselves again in a similar situation on a boat. And here comes the storm. And before they knew it, there was a this thing walking on the water and they were terrified, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. And Peter said, it's the Lord. Lord, if it is you, bid me to come to you. And he began walking on the water, shocked himself that he took his eyes off of Jesus and began to drown and Jesus was right there immediately rescuing him. And again, he chastised them. Why do you doubt, O oh ye, of little faith? They had struggled with their faith, and you and I, we must be careful that we do not have stony hearts of unbelief. Again and again, as he encountered the, cr the crowds, he encountered the scribes and the Pharisees, and their unbelief and their hypocrisy that he had to chastise them. He warned them against the traditions of man versus God's truth. And he said to them that your worship towards me is a complete farce, that you worship me with your lips only, but your hearts are far from me. And he warned them, and he warned his disciples, as much as he's warning you and I today about our inner purity, our heart, our true worship towards him. That we have got to be careful that it is not what we eat that condemns us, that defiles us, but it is what is coming from our heart. And again, he found himself tired. And he wanted to be with his disciples so that he can teach them about kingdom principles. And he found himself in the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he wanted it to be kept a secret so that he can have this private time with his disciples. But before you know it, this Gentile woman comes before him and she's begging him, Master, Master, my child, my child is sick. Would you come and heal my child? And Jesus said this crazy thing to her. Jesus said, I have come to the lost tribe of Israel. It is not right to give the meat to the dogs. And what she said next was amazing. She said, Lord, 
even the dogs eat from the crumbs of the table. And Jesus said to her, great is your faith, a Gentile, a Gentile, great is your faith, your child is healed. And she went home and just as he said, the child was healed. And again we find some friends brought this man, this man, he was deaf and he was mute. And Jesus sticked his finger in the man's ear and the man could hear. And then he did something weird. He, he spat on his fingers and he touched the man's tongue. <laughs> and the man could hear and the man could speak. And he found himself again by a crowd of hungry, tired people. And again he repeated the miracle and fed 4,000 people and there were seven baskets left over for the disciples to have. And he warned them, do not tell anyone about this. But the Gentiles glorified God. They said, everything he does is wonderful, wonderful. The Gentiles. And again we find the Jews, the scribes, the Pharisees with their unbelief coming at him, condemning him. And this is what they did. They asked for a sign. Give us a sign and prove to us that you are who you said you are. And he said, why does this generation keep asking for a sign? You will have no sign. And he withdrew again from them. It came time for him to complete his ministry in Galilee. And so, while with his disciples, he took the time to predict his death, and he said this to them, the son of man will be rejected by leaders, and he will be killed. But the third day he would rise again. And Peter said this to him, don't say that, Lord. And Jesus looked at Peter and immediately he said, get behind me, Satan. You speak not the things of the kingdom, you are speaking from your flesh. And from time to time, he revealed some secrets to his disciples because they needed to know some important things. And you and I, we need to know these secrets as well. And he said this to them, suffering leads to glory. Nobody likes that. That to get glory, you would have to suffer. And he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they said, some say you are Moses, some say you are Elijah. And he said, but who do you say I am? And here comes Peter, I like him. Always had something to say. He said, thou art the Christ, son of God. And Jesus said to him, flesh and blood have not revealed that to you, Simon, but God himself. And he took his inner circle up to the mount. And when they got there, a bright light shone around them. And there was Jesus and Moses and Elijah and Peter again couldn't help himself. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. Let us build three monuments. And then a voice appeared. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And Jesus took them down off the mountain and said to them, tell no one what you saw until my resurrection. The next secret he revealed to them was this. Power comes from faith. And they got that down to the mountain. And the Pharisees were arguing with his disciples and he said to them, what is going on? Why are you arguing? And the father of this child came and he said something. He said, I asked your disciples to heal my child and they couldn't. They couldn't. The disciples had failed and Jesus himself using his authority cast the demon out of the man's child. And when they were in secret with him, they said, Lord, how come we couldn't do it? 
And Jesus said to them, this kind can only come from prayer. He said, this can only come from prayer. He said, this can only come from prayer. Are you praying? Are you praying because prayerless people are powerless people and when people come to the disciples of Jesus for help, you cannot help them because there is no prayer and there is no power because power comes from faith. He said, you've got to be praying. You've got to look after your spiritual life. And the next secret he revealed to them was service leads to honor. They found themselves walking away after this miracle. And those disciples are bickering with each other about who is the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus asked them, why were you arguing? And they didn't want to tell him, but he knew. And he took a little child and he reminded them that if you want to be first in the kingdom, those who want to be the greatest in the kingdom must be last in the kingdom. And you must serve. You must serve. And he said, everyone who accepts little children accepts me and accepts the father. Your, 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 your children's ministry director told me to put a plug in for kids ministry. Are you serving children? Are you serving children? Scene three, the servant's journey to Jerusalem. On his way to Jerusalem, he again encountered the crowd and he stopped as usual to, to teach them. But even within that crowd, he found the scribes and the Pharisees. And as a master teacher, he used various methods to communicate the good news of the kingdom. He used symbols and miracles and proverbs and parables. But this time, he used what is known as a paradox. And they are questioning him about marriage. Lord, is there marriage in heaven? And if a man dies and leaves his wife and she marries his brother, whose wife it is in the kingdom? And, and Lord, can a man put away his wife? Because Moses said that we can. And he used the paradox by saying, two shall become one. And here is the saying, Jesus opened up scripture and he said, God created male and female and he said that a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cling to his wife and the two shall become one and that God's intent for marriage was eternal that you cannot just put your wife away randomly and Moses gave that law because their hearts were so hardened and then he said to them adults shall be as children. The mothers were bringing their children to Jesus for him to touch them and bless them. And these disciples, they, they do crazy things sometimes. They, they cast the children away. You, you, you know this one. When mothers are failing, their children brought to Jesus. The stern disciple drove them back and bade them to depart. But Jesus saw them ere they went and sweetly smiled and kindly said, Suffer little children to come unto me. Do you know that? He said, I would receive them and fold them in my bosom. I'll be a shepherd to those lambs, so drive them not away. Are you teaching children? Are you bringing children to Jesus? He, he loved children. He would always touch the children and he would bless them and he wants us to have this childlike faith as well and then he said to them the first shall be last in comes this rich 
young ruler. And he said, good master, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom? And Jesus said to him, obey the commandments, that's simple enough. And he looked at Jesus and he said, I have done all of that since my youth. And Jesus said, you have done well. But one thing, sell everything that you have, then come and follow me. And the rich young ruler walked away sad. It, it is like many people today, we are caught up with things. Our hearts are not completely for God. God is not first in our lives. And so when God asks us to let something go, when God asks us to move to a different place, we cannot do it because we are so tied to the earthly things that we love. And then he said to them, servants shall be rulers. The servants are the rulers. It's crazy, these disciples. Jesus had spent time telling them that he would die. And James and John had the nerve to come to him, not, not to touch him and to say, Lord, we love you. But they said, Lord, we want to ask you something and we want you to give it to us. And Jesus said, what is it? And they said, we want to sit at your side in the kingdom. And Jesus looked at them and said, can you drink from the bitter cup that I drink from? Can you be baptized in my baptism? And they said, we can. And Jesus said, you will signifying that they too will suffer. They too will die for the gospel. And then he said, it is not for me to decide who sits on the right or who sits on the left. Servants must serve. Scene four, the servants' ministry in Jerusalem. Jerusalem at Passover time was a delight to the Jews, but it was a despair to the Romans. Massive, massive crowd would gather in Jerusalem for Passover, and it is here that Jesus found himself less than one week before his crucifixion. And as he sat on the Mount of Bethphage, he said to his disciples, where to go to find him a colt, an unridden colt. And they brought the colt back to him. And, and Jesus got on this colt. And as a servant king, he made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The crowd all shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna! We're so glad that you're here. Save us. But he was not faced by the crowd because he knew again who was in this crowd and he rode all the way up to the temple. And as he got to the temple, he, he just looked around quietly and then he left. And the next day we see him as the servant judge. And he's on his way back to the temple and he was hungry. And so in a distance he saw a fig tree with leaves. And whenever a fig tree has leaves, it must mean that it has fruit as well. And as he walked and he got near to this fig tree with leaves only, there were no fruits. And he cursed it. Never had we seen him curse a living thing before. And he said to this tree, no one will ever eat of your fruit. Signifying that he spoke of the religious leaders who only had the appearance of bearing fruits, just a fast, just pretending to be who they were not. And he said, you bear no fruits, and because you bear no fruits, I curse you. And then we see him as a servant judge. He, he got to the temple. 
Man, he was crazy. <laughs> he got to the temple. I'd never seen him so angry a day in my life. And he began turning tables over. And he had this whip. And he's whipping people out of the temple. And everybody is scattering for their lives. And the Pharisees, highly offended, thought to kill him. But Jesus said, how dare you? My father's house shall be a house of prayer. How dare you turn it into a den of thieves? The Gentiles had right to access, but they were there stealing from people, all of their witches, so that they can be wealthy. And knowing that his disciples needed to be prepared for his coming death, he took time out to teach them again. The Jews were proud of the temple. Why, even the disciples were impressed with the monuments and the massive stones, and they were shocked when Jesus said to them that all of this will collapse and be destroyed. And they said to him, when will this be? And Jesus took time and he educated them on what is known as the Olivet Discourse. And he began telling them that the day will come where they would face suffering, where persecution will come. Temples will be destroyed and the wrath of God will fall upon men. And Jesus said to them, take heed. Take heed that in the last days you are not deceived because many will come in my name preaching a gospel that is not of me, declaring that they are me and telling you that they know when my return will be, but no man knows, save the Father, when he would return. And he said to them, take heed that you are not discouraged when suffering comes. Take heed that you are not discouraged and you quit when you have to endure disappointments and persecution. And then he said to them, watch and pray. Watch and pray and know the signs of the times. And while thousands of people at the Passover were having a glorious time waiting for this wonderful meal, Jesus was preparing for his crucifixion. He had set his face towards Jerusalem. And he has set his heart to complete his father's will. And while in Bethany one day, he found himself at the home of Simon the leper. And he's relaxing after having a wonderful meal. And out of nowhere comes this woman. And she walks up to him and she breaks open this jar, this alabaster jar, of expensive perfume and she pours it over his head and she anoints his head and she cries and she glorified him and she praised him and she worshipped him and as they all flowed down to his feet she found him herself at his feet wiping his feet with her hairs and those in attendance became offended and they said what a waste what a waste. And he said to them, leave her alone, for she has done what you have not done. She has anointed my body for the burial. And from this day on, whenever the gospel is preached, her name will be remembered as a testimony of what she had done for me. Her heart, her faith, her worship was real. And then he found himself in the upper room. For so long he had eager to share a meal, the last meal with his disciples. And while in the upper room, he took time to wash his disciples' feet. Imagine the Lord bending low, washing dusty, crusty feet of his disciples. And he said to them, the hour is coming. And he told them that they would abandon him. 
He said, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep would be scattered. And Peter said to him, always Peter, always Peter. Peter said, Lord, they may leave you, but I never will. And Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Simon Peter, before the cock crow crows twice, you would deny me three times. He found himself sharing the Lord's Supper. And he looked at them and he said, one of you will betray me. And these disciples who days before had spent the time arguing over who would be the greatest in the kingdom found themselves wondering, am I the vilest? And they asked of themselves, it is I, is it I, is it I? And it was found out that it would be Judas. And he said to Judas, that which you planted to do it quickly. And Judas left and he broke bread with his disciples. And he shared of the cup which represented a new covenant. And after that, the Lord did something amazing. He, he sang hymns. Can you sing? Knowing that within hours, you would be crucified. And they left the upper room. And he took those in his innermost circle and he found himself in the garden of Gethsemane and he looked at them and he said my soul is sorrowful unto death can you can you watch with me can you stay up with me and he walked a distance away from them and he found himself in deep prayer and when he got back those disciples were asleep and he said, Peter, could you not watch? And he went back to pray. And he agonized. And he said, Father, if it is your will, let this bitter cup pass me by. Daddy, please, please, please. And he agonized so much that he sweat was like drops of blood. And by the time he got back to his disciples, those disciples were asleep and he went back to his father in prayer and he said, Father, Abba Father, thou can do all things. Would you let this bitter cup pass me by? And he cried because he knew that within hours they would crucify him and having to face the horror of his death, he agonized and then he said, nevertheless, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And he went back to the disciples and he said, come along, it is time, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be taken. And here comes Judas. Rabbi! Betrayed his master with a kiss. And Peter, almost always Peter, Peter pulled out this knife and flashed the man's ear off. It was chaos. In the garden it was clean and the disciples found themselves doing exactly what he had predicted they would do. They would abandon him. They would forsake him. And they all ran away and Jesus was arrested. And he found himself in the palace facing Pilate. And the Pilate asked of him, Are you the Messiah? And he said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand side of the Father coming on the clouds of heaven. And the crowds were so angry, they said, you need no further witness, crucify him. And they mocked him. And they spat on him. And they whipped him. And Pilate offered, brought him to the crowd, and they brought Barabbas, a thief, a dirty criminal, and Pilate said to the crowd, who do you want, Barabbas? Oh, Jesus the Christ. And this, this crowd, this same crowd, this, how 
Hosanna crowd, this help me Jesus crowd, looked on and they said, crucify him, crucify him. He is not our king, give us Barabbas. And the Roman soldiers, they took him and they gave him a good flogging. And he stood before the crowd, bruised and battered. And he said, not a word. Not once did he defend himself, but like a sheep being led to the slaughter, he went with them. A message that you and I need to learn that when we face persecution, do not behave like goats bleating all over the place. He was condemned. And if they took him to Golgotha and they placed him on the cross prepared and they nailed nails in his hand with each vicious pound that you can hear echo for miles away he screamed and they hammered and he screamed and they hammered and he screamed and he found himself this Jesus this perfect servant on a cross on the shameful cross between two thieves how is it possible and he's on the cross and he's in pain and he's exhausted and he said father i have glorified thee on the earth i have finished the work that you have given me to do wouldn't it be wonderful if that was our testimony when we come to the end of our life's journey that we too would be able to look back on our lives in spite of all the pain in spite of all the suffering and we could we could give thanks we could give thanks for the life God bless us with. And if we were to look forward, even in the face of death, and face it with anticipation, and face it with expectation, and say like Jesus, Father, I have finished the work. I have glorified your name. Daddy, I'm coming home. I'm coming home, Daddy. And while on the cross suffering, he was thirsty. And they mocked him. And they gave him sour wine to drink. And the crowds laughed and said, ha, 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 he saved others and he cannot save himself. Come down off the cross and save yourself. This crowd, he is on the cross and it is dark, darkness on the outside, darkness on the inside. And with a loud voice, he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is me, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he gave his last breath. And he gave up the ghost and the perfect servant was dead. And Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man who had bought the tomb, he went to Pilate and he asked for the body of Christ. And he and Nicodemus, you know Nicodemus, Nicodemus, was the one who came to the servant in the night asking how can he get eternal life and Jesus said to him you must be born again he must have taken that advice and they took the body of the perfect servant our Lord Jesus Christ and they laid him in a tomb the disciples were scattered horrified, grieved, lost, and Saturday was silent. 
he was dead. The perfect servant was dead. Dying for the sins of the world, he was dead. <laughs> but I told you that he was master even over death. And yes, on Friday he was dead. And Saturday he was still dead because they had crucified him. But early, it was early, yes it was, ask Mary, she would tell you. Early one Sunday morning, yes Lord, he rose with all power in his hand. He lives, he lives, he lives, he lives, he lives, he's alive, he's alive. Mary saw it, the disciples saw it, on the water in my their sight, 500 sight, you and I. Our lives are changed because he lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives. Guaranteeing us what he had said. Truly, this is the Son of God. Truly, this is the Son of God. And he spent the next 40 days with his disciples, commissioning them he said, go into all the world and preach the good news of the gospel and those who hear and believe will be saved. Are you preaching the gospel? Are you preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? And he, the disciples watched him on that day. It must have been sad for them as they watched the perfect servant, their master, ascend back up into heaven by his father. And the disciples went forth as was commended to them. And Jesus, though no longer with them, was at the right hand of his father, working through them enabling them, and they did great and mighty and miraculous acts in the name of Jesus, the perfect servant. He came as a servant. He died on a cross, and he's now exalted to glory. And there my friends, is the gospel according to me, John Mark, about Jesus Christ, the perfect servant. Thank you for having me. Worship team. So as uh, Serena was closing, or Mark was closing, uh, she said that the disciples were being sent forth in the name of Jesus to share the gospel. And uh, so in, in response, we're going to focus on the name of Jesus. Uh, it's a beautiful name. And uh, we love each other in Jesus' name. We serve each other in Jesus' name. And we share the good news. Uh, in Jesus name for his glory. Let's stand together as we respond.